necessarily any emotion from you. Uh, we're not here to try to uh, get you to um, emotionally respond as we would in a uh, preaching context where you, you call forth your will and your emotions and your thinking and you respond to, to the gospel. But it is, it is designed for us to think about the Word of God and how we may apply it in our daily life. That, that is a different thing. And unfortunately, there are far too many Christians who like the preaching side of it. They want to feel good when they leave service on Sunday morning. They don't feel like they've drawn closer to the Lord or they've made a response to the Lord. But unfortunately, they don't always see the need of making application of the Word of God in a systematic way. Now, you know, it's been a long, long time ago since I was in high school, but I, I, I went several years to college, and nobody likes to study. Study is hard work. Study is, um, requires time and effort. It requires going over the material to see if I really know it. And yet, that's the admonishment of the, of the scriptures to you and me, that we study the Word of God. Now, my approach to Bible study has always been uh, uh, more th uh, theme-oriented and uh, series-oriented. And it's by design, it's by deliberate, it's what I'm comfortable with. When I was growing up in church, we had Wednesday night Bible study, and we may take a topic uh, that would be preached uh, one Wednesday night, and then next Wednesday it'd be something totally different, and then the next Wednesday it'd be something completely different, and we did that dance every Wednesday night. And it seemed to me, even as a, a, a an older teenager, that, well, it's just, you know, I didn't learn my ABCs in one sitting. Right. I didn't learn how to read in one, in one lesson. I didn't learn how to add or subtract or multiply and divide in, in one lesson. It took a series of lessons for me to literally apply the principles of those concepts in my life. And I think the same is true in the Word of God. We need to deal with, with particular themes long enough so that we can actually apply them to our lives and live them out. And so that has been always my approach to the Word of God is to do it with a theme and with a topic and deal with it long enough so that we can uh, actually apply it. Um, yes, sometimes I will repeat myself, not because I just turned 65, <laughs> although that might happen a little more. <laughs> In the future, but no, I do that deliberately because there's some principles. It's it's like Brother Rick and I were talking. It's it's much harder to teach a principle of conduct, a principle of life, than it is for me to hand out a list. Here it is. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. But the problem with the list is that it's not all inclusive. There's no way you can put everything in life that you and I are going to encounter on some kind of a list. That's number one. Number two, the problem with the list is that anything on the okay part, on the do list, can become, can become problematic, can become an issue by virtue of emphasis. Okay. Nothing wrong with hunting unless you do it every Sunday. Nothing wrong with fishing unless you do it every Sunday. Nothing wrong with a lot of different activities unless it takes, it, 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 but, but if it takes you away from serving the Lord or uh, being involved in this kingdom, then that can become a problem. Somebody says, well, I belong to a bowling league and I just can't afford to give any time to the church or to the ministry of, of, of the work of God. Well, then your bowling is a problem. Yeah. Hello. Amen. Because it's not, it's not the game that is the problem. It is the emphasis that you're placing on it in your life in, in, as far as a priority. So when we talk about principles of life, they're a little harder to, to share and to deal with and to, to apply because we have to use real life experiences and here's how it works and here's what it looks like. It's far easier for me to just, like I said, get up here and attempt to give you a list, but the, the, there's a problems with the list because people think that if they do the list, they're okay. 
and you may or may not be okay. I've known a lot of people over, over my, my lifespan who, who did the list, but their heart was far from God. It was corrupt. So, when we look at the Word of God, and when we look at this series that we've been dealing with, we're talking about navigating the, the uh, narrow road. And the last time we met, we, we talked about the path of liberty and love. We said there's an extremes on either side of this. There's the extreme of liberalism, where anything goes, and nothing and little to nothing is wrong, to the other extreme of legalism, where everything matters, mm -hmm. and everything uh, falls into the category of right and wrong. And both of those are extremes of really what is the, what I, I call the balanced Christian life. So the Christian life really involves a liberty and involves a liberty in the love of God. See, I don't serve the Lord for fear of hell. And if you walk with God any, any length of time, that should, be, that, that should be true of you. So, and I will tell you, there's a problem that after many, many years, if you're walking with God only because you're escaping hell and you got your fire insurance paid up, you're not walking in the liberty of love. Because I'll tell you something that's much stronger than the threat of hell, and that is the love of God. Amen. There's nothing stronger in this world than love. That's right. And when people fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, then their lives are going to reflect that in everything that they do. But you see, the basic motivation will be love. So when we talk about liberty, we're talking about sound doctrine that's balanced. Not extremes from right or left. I've been in I've been in this thing all my life, and I've I've seen the extremes from right to left. I've seen everything from standing up to sitting down being a sin, all the way to nothing matters. So those are extremes. And let me just say, when we talk about the the path of liberty and love, we're not talking about being free to do what we want. We're free to do what we ought. And there's a big difference. So he says, also it is relational. It means you have a relationship, an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. People fail the Lord, not because of just the pull of the, uh, pull of the world, although that may be part of it. It's because they're not continuing to, de to develop their relationship with the Lord. Do you know relationships are never static very long? In other words, in any kind of relationship, you don't do this, you know, if it's not growing and it plateaus off and it continues to plateau off for a length of time, then there's going to be some problems, don't you think? Because that relationship is not ongoing. It's gone to a point and then it's stopped. Well, the same can be true with our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you're not going forward, you're backing up because time marches on. So it's also reasonable. I want you to know being a Christian is the most reasonable thing in the world. Now it takes faith and it takes the Holy Ghost to live it. But it is reasonable. It's rational. It's relational. It's responsible. I have a responsibility. Paul says I have an obligation. I have a responsibility to the Jew and the Gentile. I have a responsibility to the Lord. I'm a I'm his love slave. Amen. I have responsibilities. We're living in a time where far too many Christians have an entitlement mm -hmm. mindset. They come to church expecting everything to come their way. And if you've got to sing the right song, speak the right message, you know, everybody come and shake their hands without them doing anything else on their own. But you see, we have responsibility, and when you walk in the liberty of love, they'll be responsive. You'll be responsible concerning your conduct and your attitude, which will determine your altitude. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So we are transformed by the grace of God, rather than reformed or uh, uh, or, or just rebellious, as far as those other two are concerned. Um, let's look at the next one. The path of liberty and love is that uh, they, but they, wait a minute. 
They believe and are led by the Spirit of God. When we walk in the liberty of the love of God, there is a, there is a principle of life of walking in the Spirit, of uh, feeling after the, the Spirit of God, of wanting to please Him. There is also, we walk in God's righteousness, not our own righteousness, because according to Titus, there's nothing that we can do, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, are we saved, but according to His mercy. So we walk in the righteousness of Christ. And let me just say this about that. When I begin to personally understand that I am robed in God's righteousness and not anything that I can do, it sets you free. Yes. It sets you free to, to live for the Lord. Yes. <laughs> and uh, far too many, uh, over the years, I've seen far too many Christians who, who live under fear. And we're going to be talking about the freedom that comes in Christ. That if I do this thing, God's going to get me. That if I make a mistake this week, if I slip and say a bad word, I'm going straight to hell. I don't pass go. I don't collect $200. I'm just, I'm just lost. Or if I behave in a way that's uh, uh, not something I actually plan to do, but it just happened, that somehow um, if Christ were to come at that moment, I wouldn't go with him. You know, that's an awful way to have to live. That's like, let me give you an example. That's like your children making a mistake and wondering whether they're going to get kicked out of the house or not. Hello? Amen. It's like your children saying something and wondering whether you're going to accept them or not or love them anymore. I've had people say to other people that if you do this, this, and this, God will love you more. How terrible is that? First of all, while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. So if he loved us while we were sinners, how much do you think he loved us now that we're his own? But it's a terrible mindset to live under the fear that I'm going to be lost. That if I, if I trip or if I skin my elbows and my, my nose and my head and my knees all at one time, that uh, God's going to kick me out of the kingdom. No, God's, my, our Heavenly Father is going to deal with us as we as fathers and mothers deal with our children whom we love. Right. We're going to correct them. Yeah. We're going to instruct them. Mm -hmm. We're going to help them in their journey. Yes. We're going to love them with an unconditional love, yes. hopefully. Right. And yet, there's, there's things that we need to instruct. So that's the way the Lord deals with us. But I've, I've watched so many people live under a fear that if I, if I violate this or if I do this, then God's going to get me. <clears throat> How many people don't come to church because they think the roof's going to cave in on them? <laughs> well, where'd they get that? How many people don't come back to church because they're afraid somebody's going to point the finger and say, I told you so. How many people don't come back to God because the elder brother is going to get to them first before Christ does? You remember the elder brother, don't you? Yeah. So it's tragic when people do. When, when I begin to understand that I walk in Christ's righteousness, that I'm robed with his righteousness, not my righteousness. Now, does that absolve me from living a I like pleasing the Lord? Absolutely not. But I'm free to live for the Lord because I'm robed in His righteousness. Amen. He's the one that paid the price, folks. He's the one that bled and died. He's the one that became the substitute for our sins. He took our place on Calvary. So you and I have His righteousness, which is a wonderful thing. And there's the reality of a relationship. It's not just a religion. Religion is always do-oriented. You take any religion in this world and you will find and discover that it is always do-oriented. You have to do something in order to be pleasing to your God. But you see, in, in, in Christianity, it's different because it's be-oriented, not do-oriented. It's relationship oriented. It matters. My relationship with Christ matters. 
And I want that to be a growing and ongoing relationship. Can you say amen? Amen. Pleasing Christ matters. Amen? amen. Pleasing Christ matters. Amen. So that, that's, the, that's the important thing. And then we go to the next point here is <coughs> the scripture says <coughs> we are to live a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable unto whom? Amen. Not to the world, not to other people, but unto God. Amen. How many people live certain certain ways simply because of what other people might say or not say? And yet, really, the only one that matters is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, I'm going to get into our responsibility to one another. And we're going to deal with that. Because that's where Christianity is really lived out and walked out. Yeah. You love God. Yes. And you love others. Yeah. So that's where it really is. And we're going to deal with that uh, in, in depth. So there's a living sacrifice. There's a spiritual and, lo uh, and loving in conscience. Spiritual and loving in conduct and attitude. So we have uh, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by what? The Holy Ghost. So the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by what? The so the more of the Holy Ghost you have and expand that, that God's uh, renewed spirit in your life, it should translate into more of, of the love of God in our life. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you want to know what God is, the Bible tells us what God is. <clears throat> God is love. love. God is love. So, you're growing in grace and truth. There's a growth that goes on in our lives. All right. Titus says, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking unto, for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, there's the Christian life in a nutshell. There's the Christian life in a nutshell because it deals not only with the what, the, um, the things that we should do. So when you look at that, there's a profile of, of a Christian lifestyle. When we walk in the liberty and the love of God, there's a profile that goes with that. You can know what it looks like. Jesus said, you know, if a tree is good, then its fruit's going to be good, right? right? If the tree is bad, the fruit's going to be bad. You don't go to a well and drink sweet water out of a well that's got bitter water in it. It's either going to have good water or bad water. And he says, by the fruit you shall know what the person is. See, I can say I love God. I love God with all my heart. But then Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you. You'll do what I say. Lip service is pretty cheap, folks. Talk is cheap. So there is a profile for, for the Christian lifestyle. So when we look at it, first of all, it's grace brought. Grace brought salvation and redemption. I thank God for his grace. Amen. That's unmerited favor, folks. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything for it. It's God's grace. And that is clear. It is the grace of God. And Paul begins this, he says, for the grace of God that brings salvation. And it's God's grace that brings salvation. I will tell you, it takes God's grace to be saved, and it takes God's grace to be kept. Amen. We're not saved by grace and then kept by works. We're saved by grace and kept by grace. So he says, number, number two, we, he redeemed us from what? See, he didn't redeem us in our sins. He redeemed us from our sins. Far too many people want the grace of God, but they want to continue living the way they've been living. They want to continue to live a wicked lifestyle. Well, they need to go back and experience God's grace because 
God's grace teaches us some things. First of all, God's grace in verse 14 redeems us, purchases us, buys us from all iniquity. <clears throat> so when you look at that, Christ paid the ransom for the cost of our sins in order to set us free from our sins. Not only that, he says, that this grace is for everyone. It's for the sins of the world. He said, grace appeared, who gave himself. Christ gave himself. He said, no man takes my life from me, I give it. So Christ gave himself, and the key word here is, uh, the key operative word is, is God's grace is operative and active today only when we respond to the message. Amen? Amen. So once we respond to that message, <clears throat> then God's grace appears to us Amen. and redeems us. Yes. And it says it also, it does a couple things. And let me go to, to this, uh, this slide here. Two principles of grace. Two principles of grace. Number one, grace teaches us. Right? First of all, grace saves us, which we talked about already. Secondly, grace instructs us. Now, here's the way the Lord always operates. Do you remember the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and was going to be ready to be stoned? Where was the guy? If she was caught in the act, where was the guy? But these hypocrites <clears throat> uh, wanted to bring the woman and, and stone her. And um, you know the story. Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. They all left, and it was just Jesus and this woman. That's right. Now, here's the way God always works. He says, where are your accusers? They're gone. He said this, neither do I yeah. condemn thee. Amen. Now, God always offers grace first. God always offers mercy first. This is the way the Lord approaches you and me. And then secondly, he offers instruction. Now go and sin no more. That's the way God always works. It's first grace and mercy. Aren't you glad that's the way he dealt with you and me? <laughs> but then comes the follow-up that grace also instructs us. And that's what he said. Grace teaches us some things. He says, therefore, in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies or grace of God, that you offer your life as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Do you know our ability to say yes to the Lord comes from his grace? Amen. We didn't crank up our willpower and say, okay, Christ comes to me and I said yes. No, the ability to say yes was a grace and a gift from God. And the ability to say yes tonight to the Lord is a gift from the Lord. It's not something we have earned. It's not something we generate in and of ourselves. Because that would be a work, wouldn't it? But it is the grace of God that comes into our life that gives us the ability, not only gives us the desire, but also gives us the ability to say yes to him. He says, and it is through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. The grace that you and I have is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Nobody can boast and say, you know, I've lived a pretty good life on my, you know, by cranking up my willpower. Mm -hmm. If you've lived a pretty good life, it's because of God's grace and mercy. Amen. And so it's true of salvation. It continues to operate in my life and in the life of the believer. So he says, grace saves us, but grace teaches us. Let me say People who have truly experienced God's grace and understand redemption will, now hear me, will respond by conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. And this is what he means when he said, 
Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what? Reasonable, Reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewal of your mind. So you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So when we talk about God's grace <coughs> teaching us, those who have experienced God's grace, and hear what I'm saying when I say this, will, will respond by allowing Christ's grace to transform them and then to be conformed to the image of Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. You see, real grace operating in a believer's life will produce a Christ-like life. Let that sink in. The grace that's operating in a believer's life will produce a Christ-like life that is relational, that is responsible, that is reasonable. And that reasonable form of worship is a living sacrifice holy unto God. As opposed to being casual and careless in our walk and relationship with God. You see, people don't think they need Bible study. They're not serious about their walk with God. Amen. I'll say it. Amen. 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 You know, people who are not serious about studying the Word of God are not serious about their walk and relationship. They're just way too casual and way too careless with their relationship with God, and they are frustrating the grace of God. And, and don't think that God's grace is not dealing with them. God is not passing. He's not sitting back twiddling his thumbs. But he is active. And he is endeavoring to work in people's lives. So they're either resisting it, ignoring it. You know, what Scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians, quench not the Spirit. Well, how do we quench the Spirit when we're not following the Spirit? When we're not allowing the grace of God to actively work in our lives. So his emphasis here is the principle that Christ gave himself to us. Christ gave himself to us. And that he might do what? Number one, redeem us. That is salvation. Number two, to purify us. That is the lifestyle. So, to redeem us and to purify, himself, uh, purify for himself a people that are his very own. King James Version says a peculiar people or a special people. Yeah. This translation says a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. See, you can tell a person who's walking in the Holy Spirit is because they're eager to do that which is good. They're eager. It's not, oh, do I have to? <laughs> oh, man. No, you get to. <clears throat> when people ask me sometimes about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, oh, do I have to talk in tongues? I said, no, you get to. Right. You get to. You get to speak a language you never learned in school as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. Right. <clears throat> Just like on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> I mean, no, God is still pouring out His Holy Spirit today. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, look, so, so the grace of God teaches us to conform to Christ's image and likeness. And Paul said, I want to know Christ. How many here want to know Christ? Amen. Want to know him more and more. Amen. I want to experience him more and more. Did you really think you got all of Christ on the day you were born again? You know, that's you were just a babe in Christ. Our experience, our new birth experience is just the starting point. We're just a babe in the Lord. We don't know anything. We haven't experienced really anything other than that we passed from death to life. We came out of darkness into his glorious light. That's all. From then on, we have to experience Christ in an uh, increasing measure. And that's called relationship. So in order to know Christ, we have to have a teachable spirit. We have to be a learner. We have to be teachable. 
You heard me talk about Papa Glass. In fact, uh, Sister O'Banion's family uh, are all out of the DeRitter Church there in, in Louisiana. And I knew Sister O'Banion's, Megan, I knew their, his mother and his sister, her mother and sister and some of the other family that were there. Uh, all out of the DeRitter Church in Louisiana. But, but um, uh, Papa Glass, who was a, a, the pastor there for many years, he was considered a in our in our movement in our organization, a preacher's preacher. He was just he just had, was very very unique, and um, um, just a, a, a dynamic person. But when he had a guest speaker, and when I remember, I was probably about twenty three when I first preached for Brother Glass there in Derrida as an evangelist, he's sitting on the front row with his Bible open and his pen in hand, and he's taking notes. Now, here's a guy in his 70s learning from a 21 or 22 or 23-year-old. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but that was, that was Papa Glass. He did that regardless of who was speaking. Because he always felt like there was something more to learn, something more to gain. Something more to engage Christ with. Something more that he could incorporate into his life, regardless of who was up there speaking or, or preaching or teaching. You see, the grace of God gives us a desire for the word of God, and we never should ever outgrow that, regardless of how long we have walked with the Lord and lived for him. Lord, help me to have, always have a teachable spirit. Always have a teachable spirit. When I, uh, when I really, uh, uh, when when the Lord uh, began, when the Lord began to deal with me about going into the ministry, you know, I, uh, my dad had plans for me, and I had some plans for myself as well, that didn't involve the ministry. And um, but when I, I uh, felt the call of the Lord on my life, um, I would, I would, when the preacher was preaching or teaching or wherever it is, I whipped out a piece of paper and I took notes. I started, started doing that. I was, I was, uh, um, Megan and I was talking about it and I was just uh, going over some thoughts and maybe some things that I, I, I may want to share for Sister O'Banion. <laughs> I, I have a couple, three notebooks. I, I, I have uh, the notes of my very first funeral. No one ever instructed me how to do one. It, it wasn't taught in Bible college, sad to say. It wasn't taught anywhere. Uh, Megan and I went to Lancaster, uh, Ohio, with Brother Jim Rome. And uh, we went there in January. And he took off for vacation. And somebody connected with the church passed away. And I had to do the funeral. I didn't know the person. Didn't know anything about them. No, no, no connection. So that was my very first funeral. But I was I just, just the last couple of days. I, I pulled out those notes. Lord help me. <laughs> but uh, that's what I did. Very first funeral. We always must be willing to learn and be taught the Word of God. To have a teachable spirit. One of the principles I endeavor to teach. To, the new, to those that are new in our discipleship classes, to always have a teachable spirit. Always be open to being instructed. And sometimes you'll hear some things, you say, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, you do what the brilliance do. You go to the Word of God, you search it out, and see if what's being told you is the truth. That's the way you do it. You see, Paul summarizes the Christian life, and he says this. Let me, let me close with these thoughts here. That grace will teach us some things and we will learn to avoid ungodliness and worldly lust. Yeah. To avoid it. To flee from it. It will um, include everything that a person does without... Well, you've got to avoid ungodliness because the ungodly don't consider God into the equation. Right. I've had people tell me, well, I don't read that scripture. I don't look at that passage. No, ask them why, because I don't agree with it. 
Oh, really? You know, people do not consult God. They think they they live by the principle: it's easier to get forgiveness than it is permission. And that's a horrible way to live the Christian life. Because sooner or later, that's going to blow up in your face. I assure you, and you're not going to like the consequence. You see, the ungodly person focuses on himself, but the godly person focuses on God. Amen. You see, the ungodly is self-centered rather than God-centered. The ungodly has a philosophy of life that produces a lifestyle without a consciousness of God. Romans 1, they did not like to retain God in their conscience. They want to do what they want to do whenever they want to do. He says, not only ungodliness or wickedness, but to avoid worldly passions. Worldly passions and lust are the outcome, really, of an ungodly life. And not only is it a way of thinking, but it is a specific lifestyle. People want to get into, well, if I do this little thing, will that send me to hell or not? I, I, you know, I wish God's people would get away from that kind of thinking. And instead of asking that question, they would say, will this thing honor Christ or not? Right. Instead of saying, I want to get by with what I want to get by with, at least by the skin of my teeth, so that if I do this thing or I live this such, such a way that I won't go to hell when I die, rather than saying, God, I want to know you. I want to know you more and more. I want to experience you more and more. I want to fall in love with you more and more. You see the difference in attitude? Mm -hmm. One wants to skirt by. It's a way of thinking. People get into a lifestyle rut. And, it, and they live after fleshly appetites. And they become sensual and materialistic. And they do not seek the kingdom of God first. And it's unfortunate they're not seeking God first. And how tragic, and I've seen it where parents are more interested in their children's soccer games than they are their children in Sunday school on Sunday morning. They're more interested in their children being something uh, uh, out in the world than they are them being something in the kingdom of God. They would rather them be a CEO of a, of a corporation and make tons of money rather than be in the ministry or a missionary somewhere else where they're scraping to get by. Got our priorities all messed up, don't we? Because if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul, what profit is there in that? So we need to live a self-controlled life. I will tell you, the Christian who's living under the grace of the Lord will live a disciplined life. They will live an upright life. In other words, when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, some of the passages, <clears throat> when it talks about righteousness and it talks about the qualifications of an elder, that there've got to be certain qualifications, certain characteristics of an elder. Well, don't you think that's not just for elders? Hello? That should be the qualifications of every Christian. You think elders have to be better Christians than anybody else? Or do you just think that elders have to be Christian? Hello? Is there a different Christianity for those in leadership or ministry than there is for people in the pews? Should be. To me, it's the same Christianity. You gotta love God and love others. Amen. And he says you need to live not only upright, but there also needs to be you live a godly lifestyle. You live an ordered life that's ordered by the Lord Jesus Christ and around Jesus Christ. Our decision making has its focus on God's will and God's way and God's purpose in our life in every arena of life. Whether it's personal, business, recreational, family, church, whatever it is. It's the grace of God on our lives that helps us to live that kind of quality of life. And the guiding principle is we do it all for the glory of God. 
He says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you wear, or whatever you, you do all for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We do it all for God's Christ, uh, for Christ's glory. And that should be our motivating factor. And he says, uh, the, trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3. Don't lean on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord. He will guide your path. He will direct your life. We just have to trust him, don't we? Yeah. So we close with this aspect that our motivation and our reward is this. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In Titus, he tells us that looking for that blessed hope. That's our motivation to live godly. There's coming a day when Christ is going to come back to this world again and we're going to get to see him face to face. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he says in John, John 3, verses 2 and 3, Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. If we have this hope, this blessed hope, we will purify ourselves. That's what we talk about when we talk about walking in the liberty of the love of God. In our next lesson, when we come back together, I want to talk about the freedom we have in Christ. Amen. What that looks like and what that actually means. Because God has set us free not to live under condemnation, folks, or to live under bondage. But he has set us free. Amen. But not free to do as we please, but free to do as we ought. But we're free to do it. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is your reasonable, reasonable service. Mm -hmm. People I've heard, have you ever heard people say, well, I don't know if I can live it. I said, well, what, what do you mean it? <laughs> well, of course you can't. You can only do it through Christ. But what they're saying is, is that they think it's unreasonable, <laughs> the Christian life. That's because they don't know what the Christian life means. And unfortunately, there's far too many people who are not living a Christian life. And the Christian life is not attractive. Look, light draws people out of darkness. So if people are not being drawn out of darkness, it's because the light's not bright enough. Or it's not shining at all. No man hides his light under a bushel, right? So he says, look. You purify, you purify yourself, you, you live a reasonable life, and he says, we all shall be changed to be like him. I want to live the way he wants me to live. Amen. Can we sing that? I want to live the way that he wants me 